Today, I'd like to share with you a journey of why the uncertainty of going off on a tangent can help creative ideas transcend the original brief and become more powerful. This is me, age 10, with my best friend George, and we made a T-Rex out of cardboard boxes and yogurt pots. I grew up in Cumbria, and I didn't have a lot of pre-made toys or tools. So instead of playing around with prescribed uh, things by the toy company, we had to be resourceful and creative, and trust that the meandering approach would be an adventure in itself. I didn't know at the time, but this would become core to my approach as a professional designer later in life. 25 years later, I got to work on all sorts of unusual design challenges. This is Kyle, more about him later, as we were part of a TV show called Big Life Fix. I worked with seven other amazing designers, makers and engineers, and we were tasked to help people overcome various disabilities through clever use of technology. Much of the process was about jumping into problems that were seemingly impossible. Because the initial brief was usually only partially right, we ended up often going on all sorts of different tangents in order to understand what the real questions were. Over my career, I learned to appreciate the subtlety of uncovering the right questions. Designers, as a generalisation, often prototype for answers, in other words, validation to things they want to find out. Artists, on the other hand, prototype for questions. Da Vinci, I suspect, would have done a combination of both, so I thought that would be a useful point to make, and in many ways, I needed to learn how to combine the designer's validation with the artist's questions in my work. I had to create room for uncertainty that comes from going off on a tangent and not knowing whether it was going to be worth the bother. And that the outcome would be more rewarding either personally, professionally or commercially. One example was working at Dyson. Despite being surrounded by sophisticated prototyping facilities, I still worked in cardboard. Dyson actively encouraged the speed and non-precious mindset to iterate fast. What began as a childhood pastime of tinkering had grown into a professional skill set. Spurred on by finding my tribe at Dyson, I wanted to engage other designers, and I realised that there were not actually many online tutorials to how to master the art of prototyping, and so I was compelled to try doing one. I respected daily bloggers like Spencer Nugent and his Sketch a Day blog, and emailed him asking, how do I get started? Very kindly, the advice that he gave me was give away everything you know with enthusiasm, even if it's imperfect, because it will take you places. So this was a makeshift setup in our living room to record key techniques in prototyping. And in case you hadn't guessed, this is my tripod Hang, hanging a camera on it from the ceiling with my wife's compact mirror stuck to the back of it with blue tack so I could see what my hands were doing as I was demonstrating the videos. What resulted was a rather basic but effective website. I even made tutorials on materials other than just cardboard. And then I waited, not really sure who would notice. Amazingly, this got me my first gig with a tiny computer called a Raspberry Pi. I created a tutorial on how to make a protective case from it from the very box that it was shipped in. This actually got me noticed by a wider community and took me all around Europe creating hackathons and workshops with startups and agencies. I realised that you can actually become an expert simply by going off on a tangent for long enough. As a so-called expert, I started making tools, just because I could. I had taught people how to make this seamless joint, but it required quite a lot of skill, and so I thought about making a tool to do it more easily. And here it is, the cardboard rebate tool. It also happened to work in Corex, which is the plastic you see for sale signs made from. And as it turned out, this ended up helping me make a space pod. Even on large-scale projects, I still worked in card for speed and ease of discussion with the team. 
I realized that my rebate tool, working in card and plastic, meant this space pod could be made from an unlikely material choice. Here's the Corex space pod going all the way to the edge of space and coming down safely again without any damage. So lessons learned. Make tangential tutorials alongside my day job. Get to travel Europe doing cool workshops. Make a tool just because. Got to build a space pod. Applying this mindset to a bigger task. And going back to the TV documentary, this got me thinking. The best bits of my work came from the unexpected and unplanned parts of the creative challenge. I had to allow uncertainty because I could increasingly see how it raised the bar of my work. I was lucky enough to work on diverse challenges from helping a photographer who had lost the use of his hands to enabling a visually impaired schoolboy find his friends in the playground to a novel solution to prevent sheep rustling and to Kyle who had dreamed of becoming a hairdresser and whose story I'd like to focus on as it shifted my perspective in design and provocation. Kyle was born without full use of a fully formed hand and yet he had always dreamed of becoming a hairdresser. For him becoming a hairdresser represented much more than a career change. When I met him in his training he was having difficulty holding hair and cutting it and I had to learn about hairdressing myself as well as understanding Kyle's own journey. It was not lost on Kyle that this was not a straightforward career choice but he was determined. I studied the back history of prosthetics and orthotics and spoke to leading experts at universities. Although we explored bionic and mechanical hands, these simply could not hold something as delicate as a human hair. This meant we had to revisit the original brief and ask deeper questions about our hands, our dexterity and tools. The inspiration struck when trimming hair with clippers. So the batteries had run out and the oscillating teeth that usually cut hair were now jammed and were gripping and painfully pulling my hair. And I realised this could actually be a great thing to turn into a mechanical tool that Kyle could control. This was the early prototype made from some combs and a toggle switch as well as a paper clip. It starts unlocked, hair flows through the two combs next to each other. One is then locked, bracing the hair tightly against the other and then released again by pulling in the opposite direction. So the hair flows through cleanly. Together, we had explored all manner of ideas and ultimately created something simple and effective based on tangential notion. It was so effective that his cohorts at the Hairdressing Academy actually marvelled at how well it held hair, holding actually more than their small hands could. Kyle himself started to realise that although we couldn't recreate flesh and blood, we had created a compelling alternative. So revisiting the initial considerations. The design validation, can Kyle cut hair? The artistic provocation, should Kyle cut hair? And as we might call it, the da Vinci question, what does it mean for people with an impairment to style hair? But there was still a more complex issue around perception. We both realised that it was not so much the design process, but Kyle owning the impairment that he was born with. The real merit was the journey we went on together through all its twists and turns that landed the final idea. Kyle went on to cut hair professionally in a modelling agency as well as being a professional male model himself. And whenever Carl goes next, I'm sure it's going to be another adventure. But for us both, the design collaboration went way beyond just cutting hair and became about Kyle having the confidence to do something remarkable against all the odds. Fall in love with the uncertain tangents of the creative challenge as much as the initial design brief. So... Uncertainty on a whole new level, COVID-19. 
It was the first national lockdown in the UK. We felt isolated. Virtual solutions felt a poor substitute, but physical interaction felt unsafe. Access to workshops felt like an unreasonably risky excursion. Bad news for a prototyping expert like me. The brief came from a client to create a tech art commission to celebrate a 10th anniversary. And the concept was to create an original open source 3D printable project that's fun and could be made by a stranger, even on the other side of the world. So the realization is that the first part of this was I was pretty confident that I could deliver. However, the second part, frankly, was where the uncertainty lay. How could I make it fun and how could I make it work with a stranger on the other side of the world? I knew from that uncertainty something interesting is going to happen. The traditional approach to this type of commission would have been to make something which can be viewed passively as just more entertainment. Yet the potential here was to create something despite the lockdown, a way to actively engage the community in making something together. Enter Radio Globe, a project made in lockdown, in isolation, and yet was one of the most connected things I had done. I took the origin story of the company's history, which started out in radio spares after the First World War. I wanted to capture that feeling of building something like a communication device, a bit like a crystal FM radio, but give it a modern twist. Although web radio can be accessed using websites and apps, lockdown emphasised a yearning for something more physical and playful. Radio Globe allows you to search any of 2,000 plus radio stations simply by spinning the globe and moving the pointer to a city to tune into music, news, and discussions. Os ya abre las piernas. Urskou kolaboraciu znamnitai na vesi mir. No pre Pobol sebol Alberta Magloni. The entire project was completed in four weeks in a two by two meter shed. It used simple tools, a cheap 3D printer and a tiny Raspberry Pi computer, as well as some specialist components that could be found on the client's website. Thanks, of course, to the amazing collaborators on this project. However, it's worth being honest that ordinarily I would not have chosen to work with these people because they simply didn't live near me. The creative constraint of lockdown meant that now I selected collaborators based on a talent first, not geography first basis. Much of the work was managed on digital platforms and we even got created with video calls holding our phones in different angles around cardboard models and drawing on pictures so that we could understand each other over distance. Of course, card played a heavy role. And so, it was ready to go open source to the general public. The DIY project is live on Instructables and had many detailed steps on how to make it. From printing tips, to parts, to tools, electronics and controls, wiring, and of course, installing the globe. I just wanted to show a picture here of my four-year-old son using it because I can. Sorry, anyway, because of the global media coverage, we had a bigger audience, and Radio Globe has been nominated for various awards around its original take on community engagement through open source collaboration. Radio Globe inspired people to attempt something out of their comfort zone, and many people have built and remixed the Radio Globe thanks to the open source nature of it. As a designer, there was a lot to learn simply by watching people interact with it. Now, often, Open source can just mean people download and don't actually change the designs. However, with Radio Globe, makers truly tailored it to their own preferences. 
from new colors and features to new hardware and software iterations. People really made it their own. But my personal favorite has to be Chuck, at 75 years young, who has made his own radio globe in lockdown. The irony of it was that I didn't truly have Chuck in mind when designing Radio Globe, but this is testament to the notion of being open to the uncertainty and what it might bring you as a surprise. The journey has taken me down lots of uncertain and tangential paths, but I wanted to leave on this. Fall in love with the exploration as much as the initial design brief. The creative outcome will be better for it. Thank you.